Well, there's two speakers during this 45-minute period of time, and they wanted to leave about 15 minutes for questions. So I'm going to be speeding this talk up more than it was originally designed for. So we'll hold all questions till the end, till after uh, Dr. LeBlanc talks after me. But I also have an interest in bariatric medicine, weight loss medicine, and I'm medical director for this Lake Weight Solutions a very effective program and I wanted to give you some information about that and but first I want to talk about some of the causes of obesity and the way we define obesity we're using what's called a body mass index and that takes into account not only body weight but body height and we get a formula we, we put it, the numbers in the formula we get a number If that number is between 25 and 29.9 we consider that overweight and the reason that's important is because as the BMI rises, certain other illnesses can follow along. Diabetes, high blood pressure, hypertension, gallstones, heart disease. So about two-thirds of Americans now are overweight or obese, and that's quite a change from even the early uh, 1980s. In children, we've seen a big increase in obesity also, and there's been a lot of explanations for this we're not quite sure we believe it's very complex and probably not related to just one thing in women even moderate overweight can predispose you to getting illnesses such as high blood pressure it's a steady climb from a BMI of around 22 hypertension uh, rises in uh, frequency as well as heart disease gallstones and the good news is these are not irreversible if the weight comes down, blood pressure will come down. Heart disease risk as far as heart attack and stroke goes down. Sugars become better controlled. Diabetes can be reversed with weight loss. So in the early 1900s, we were doing a lot more as far as physical activity. We were eating a lot less fats. We were eating more complex carbohydrates and fiber, which helped slow the absorptions of sugars. We ate a lot less sugar and processed sugar. And nowadays, 60% of the population and above is overweight or obese. We're eating much more sugar, less complex carbohydrates, and we do less physically. We think that this is a good part of the problem in obesity in the United States. So the gap between what's considered healthy living and what American lifestyle diet today is growing wider. This is supposed to, it's hard to see, but basically this is, ditch digging in the past. This is ditch digging now. This used to be our commute to work. This is our commute now. Big difference in the way we burn calories. Whenever I see a patient who's overweight, they always focus a lot on the calories and say, well, how many calories a day do I need to maintain my weight or lose weight? Well, I usually say if you take your weight by, if you take your weight and multiply it by 10, that'll give you a pretty good idea of where your maintenance calories are. So for instance, if somebody weighs 200 pounds, their maintenance calories are around 2,000 for a, a female. It seems today in our diet that there's, not, that there's no such thing as too much fat. Most people, when you ask them do they eat healthy, they believe that they do. But it turns out, when you look at where their calories are coming from, these are the top five. Chips, pizza, burgers, sweets, and so all these are sugars. And sugar soft drinks account for a large number of calories. So often patients, when they come into our office, they're overwhelmed with their weight. They don't know where to begin. And I often suggest at least dropping the sugar soft drinks to sugar juices is making an important change. That in and of itself can lead to substantial weight loss over time if those calories are not replaced. And our restaurant portions have gotten bigger. 900 calories just for the appetizer. And you have 1,400 for cheeseburger fries and the chicken finger dinner, not even including the dessert, 2,000 calories. You can get burgers for breakfast now. Our portion sizes have become larger at these fast food restaurants. 30 years ago, uh, a cheeseburger would be about 610 calories with the fries. Now, it's 1,500 calories with the fries. 
Back then, maybe you would have just had to exercise an hour and a half to burn off those calories. Now, it's about 234 minutes. So, when most people come in and they say, I've tried this diet, I've tried that diet, most people who have started a diet are bound to fail the diet. They choose one that has foods that they don't typically eat. It's way out of their normal eating pattern. And, or it limits them to just a certain type of food. Well, it's hard to maintain that over time. They, diets fail because it's out of what the patient would normally eat, what they like to eat. People think that it's only about calories, and it's not just about calories. I've had patients say, well, if I just cut myself down to 1,000 calories a day and do nothing else, I'm going to have successful weight loss. True, there will be some weight loss initially, but it takes more. It takes increasing physical activity. It takes reducing stress. And physical activity really, although by itself exercise does not cause weight loss, it certainly helps when you're doing calorie restriction. So how do we reduce calories? Well, portion control is one thing, but that sure does get difficult when you're looking at three meals a day, getting food from various places, grocery stores, restaurants. You know, it's hard to track all of that. So in our program, we use a tool of meal replacements, entrees, power bar, shakes that are lower calorie that help displace calories that people normally have eaten at other restaurants. This is all research-based. Meal replacements do work. It's easier to have somebody substitute a meal with an entree or power bar shake that's low calorie than tell them, no, you can't ever have this type of food or that type of food again. And we focus on to-do attitudes. Not, not what not to do, but what is going to be successful. These are the behaviors that we try to expound to our patients. So our patients usually have two commitments. One, that they'll show up for our meetings to get education on lifestyle changes. It's very important to help with long-term weight loss. Also, we give them a follow-up phone call each week just to see how they're doing, encourage them along the way. And then they keep daily records of all of their food that they're taking in. So we usually have our patients work towards a minimum of 2,000 calories of physical activity a week. And that's not exercise like you would typically think all the time. Getting up when you're on the couch, getting up, walking around the house, doing your own housework, doing your own yard work, pacing back and forth when you're on the phone, all of these things add up throughout the week to burn calories. We encourage our patients in the most intense phase of our weight loss program to take in 35 meal replacements, which is basically three shakes, two entrees a day to help them feel really full. And then we also, in maintenance, have them substitute one or two meals a day indefinitely to help keep their calories down. And we've taught them about exercise and the importance of that. And we've talked to them about the importance of reducing stress. And we've talked to them about how to make proper food choices and how to read food labels. They're learning all of this because this is, these are the tools that are going to be necessary to keep the weight off long term. I'm sure it's better to have lost than have never lost at all, but we want people to get good long-term results. This program can do that. And what I'd like to just for time's sake is go and look at some of our results. So, This, again, summarizes what we do. We have a decision-free part of the program where people are doing our meal replacements, entrees, power bars, and shakes. Every day, they're not hungry. We find hungry people end up failing diets. That's another reason other diets fail. Hormonal changes that are going on in your body help drive appetite. For instance, there's a condition we call insulin resistance, and that comes on patients for a number of reasons. It can be genetic, it can be a lack of exercise, but what happens is as a person gains weight, their resistance to insulin goes up. So the pancreas responds by making more insulin to keep the sugars controlled. And it can do this for a while, but over a number of years the pancreas eventually burns out and you get diabetes. But it's a vicious cycle. The more weight one gains, the more insulin has to be made. Insulin drives hunger. 
drives fat storage, more weight gain, and the process just continues on. So it's not just about willpower. There are things going on in your body physiologically that are encouraging further fat growth. It's a complex interaction with the brain, the gut, and the fat. There's a lot of signals going around, hormonal changes that are going around that are redundant, that keep people's... It's almost like your body wants to stay in an overweight state once it gets there. It's more than willpower. I want to really emphasize that. People feel like failures, but there's so much more going on to that. That's why one pill doesn't just work, because that only addresses one aspect of being overweight. That's why exercise alone doesn't work, because that addresses one aspect. That's why this program involves calorie reduction, which addresses that part. We get people exercising, which helps lower insulin resistance. As the fat starts going away, the insulin resistance is going down too. If we have patients in our program who are losing weight slower than what we predict, there's medications that we can use to help control calorie intake and insulin resistance. And those patients often will see me as they're going through their weight loss journey. But in the end, in this decision-free, people have lost, on average, of 20% of their body weight within three months. We see it all the time. We've had patients who come in at 400 pounds, and when they're finished with their decision-free part, at the, if they choose to go on another six months or a year, they can get down to an ideal weight. But they also have the tools and the support system to help keep that weight off long term. And I'm going to show you that in this slide right here. So at three years, in this study of 1,000 patients, almost 40% were still keeping off greater than 20% of their body weight. When a person loses 5% body weight, we already see improvements in insulin resistance starting to occur. We see improvements in blood pressure and sugar control. So you don't have to be an ideal weight to get healthier. But when you talk to physicians and they say, what does successful weight loss mean? And most doctors will tell you, if I get 5% off or 10% off, that's, that's successful. Now, patients want a lot more than that. This program gets patients a lot more than that 5 or 10%. And I think my time is about up, so I'm going to turn it over to Dr. LeBlanc. We'll hold questions till the end. So really, obviously, I'm basically here to talk to you about the surgical solutions to an expanding waistline. Some of the stuff that... Um, that the end result of all of the loss of weight is really just a healthier lifestyle. Nobody really seeks to lose weight just to become a, you know, a model and all that sort of stuff. And it's funny what insurance companies say about that sort of stuff. But um, today, really, I think the definition of obesity, Dr. Meek has already covered. And I'm just really, in a brief manner, just going to discuss some of the surgical options. Uh, the, what I do tell people, though, is one way to gradually know if you're, what your weight should be. If you're basically for a woman, it's about 80 pounds over your ideal body weight is roughly you're going to be a surgical candidate. But we still, too, use the BMI that Dr. Meek talked about. It turns out in people that are worried about having an operation for weight loss, the risk of not having the weight loss surgery is much higher than having the surgery. If the, if the statistics are such that there's more complications related to weight rather than the surgery itself. So this is just a, a brief list of some of the complications related to over, uh, obesity. The most common, of course, is diabetes and high blood pressure, but we see a lot of patients that have sleep apnea. So to know if you're a candidate for surgery, we also use the NIH criteria. If your BMI is over 40, and you're completely healthy with no, nothing wrong, you're a candidate for that. If, you have, if it's under, 35, uh, under 40, but over 35, you have to have one of these conditions that you just saw. And frankly, most people have that. So these are the current procedures that we're doing. Um, you'll, they're all laparoscopic. That's one thing that people come asking if they're laparoscopic. They're all laparoscopic. You get six holes. If you, Think about, if you know anybody that's had a gallbladder operation, use four holes for that. But we use six holes to do this. And, and the benefit is just astounding to do it laparoscopically. Now, the band is one of the older uh, procedures that are out there. That's just basically taking a band and putting it on top of the stomach, and it's inflatable. The, it, all it does is it has nothing to do with malabsorption, which the bypass does. It just basically limits the intake 
of the food that you can take at any one time. The weight loss that you can sort of guess that you might get is about 35 to 50 percent. EBL is excess body weight. It turns out, though, in our experience, it's not as successful as that. It, we, frankly, don't hardly ever do that operation at all because it's very disappointing. And it turns out that these complications, the slippage it can move and the erosions into the stomach are uh, high enough that that, uh, that that is actually, this procedure has more complications related to it that require surgery than the other two. The gastric bypass is actually the oldest procedure. That procedure is, di is designed for two things, to restrict, is there a point, is there, that is to restrict, we just divide the top of the stomach and make that pouch 20 cc's. Now an ounce is 30 cc's, so we make it 20 cc's. Now it stretches, that's why we start so small. And then the other part is the bypass segment where you bypass the stomach and part of the intestine. And so it has a malabsorptive component. So there's a, a part of the food that you eat, you don't, it doesn't go through all the normal path of the intestine so you don't absorb as much. There's a, and the excess body weight loss is a lot higher, it's about 80%. Although we do have a fair number of people that do get down to their ideal body weight. This particular operation and the sleeve too, there's a lot of gut hormones. I know Dr. Meek mentioned about hormonal stuff, but there's a lot more to these surgeries than just the physical alteration of the, the uh, intestine and all. So there's some, a lot of hormonal stuff that's changed when we do these operations. Like any surgery, it does have some risks. They're very, very low. Uh, the one that's um, not a complication, I mean, these, this, if any time you cut across the intestine, you can have a, a potential where it doesn't hold and it leaks. But the one that's dumping syndrome basically is prevents sugar, sweet eaters from eating sweets because it, if you uh, put concentrated sugars into that part of the small intestine, it's not meant for that. And so your body draws in a lot of fluid and makes you sick as heck. And so you do that a few times and you realize, I can't eat as much sugar. This operation does require, because of the bypass, that you take certain vitamins as chewables because you won't absorb them as well again. Now the sleeve gastrectomy, frankly, is the most popular operation. And uh, actually, Louisiana has led the way that, that in the country we do more sleeves than any state, but it's rapidly changing across the country because the sleeve is a simpler operation. All we do, it's, we just cut this part of the stomach off and it's gone forever. So this is pretty permanent. This can't be undone. Um, and it also has some hormonal uh, changes too. So, but there's no malabsorption. The thing with this operation, I don't know if you've heard of the hormone ghrelin, that operation, the top of the stomach creates this hormone which makes you hungry. We're removing that part of the stomach. The bypass actually detaches the part of that part of the stomach from the food. So those two operations result in a lot of patients not feeling hungry, which is a good thing. Um, it is a lot easier than the other operations. And it clearly can't be reversed. And the weight loss uh, is actually, it really is on par with the bypass. And, so that, and you don't have to take, in time, you don't have to take the supplemental vitamins like you do with the bypass. So this operation is really more popular than any others. We do 90% sleeves today. And the rest are bypasses and really no no uh, bands. But the thing to remember with all of these operations, it doesn't cure anything. It's a tool to help you lose weight. But if you try hard enough, you can defeat it no matter what we do. Now this is a busy slide, but it just shows the differences of them. Uh, the banding has the least operative risk, but it has more complications re requiring more operations. And it's, you don't need, it's harder to be compliant with that one. That's why it's not, a, not our preference. So really, if, if you meet the NIH criteria, you're a candidate. But you, we, have to, we do investigations before the surgery, of course, to make sure that you don't have other problems that could be causing obesity. The one thing that there is a thing that is known, it's called transfer addiction, that we don't want to have patients going into these operations having addictions. But sir, there's a small subset of patients that will actually become addicted to something else, like alcohol, gambling, shopping. So that's something that, that it's been, that's known. Everybody gets a psychological evaluation, frankly, to kind of identify anybody that might have some of those issues. 
and um, everybody has to be dedicated to the lifestyle change. So I think I met my time, didn't I? <laughs>